Would you please welcome Dr. Eckhard Schnabel? Thank you. Uh, the main focus this morning is on Christ. Uh, we during this conference we talked about scripture, about grace, about faith, uh, and uh, Luther's main focus, of course, was on solus Christus in many ways, on Christ alone. Uh, Kyrios, Jesus, Christos, Jesus Christ the Lord, Jesus Messiah the Lord. It's foundational for understanding God and for granting salvation. Uh, and he's foundational for understanding how Christians behave, how they live as authentic followers of Jesus. And I want to look at 1 Corinthians to show, uh, uh, to gain insight into the relationship between the significance of Jesus Christ uh, and uh, uh, ethics. The Apostle Paul begins and ends his letters, his letter uh, to the uh, Corinthians with these words. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he ends his letter in chapter 16. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Let anyone be accursed who has no love for the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Let anyone be accursed who has no love for the Lord. Maranatha, our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with all of you in Christ Jesus. And so I want to explore five areas of uh, Paul's ethical uh, exhortations uh, in uh, 1 uh, Corinthians. First, uh, Jesus is the foundation of Christian uh, behavior. The behavior of some Christians in the Corinthian church was informed by the values and behavioral patterns of uh, Roman society, uh, reflected in the fact that these believers had not fully grasped the redemptive power of uh, the gospel. And this explains why Paul not merely corrects wrong behavior by admonishing them. Paul does indeed rebuke, admonish, reprimand, warn, correct, and encourage the believers in Corinth. The focus, more often than not, however, is on the theological basis of uh, authentic Christian thinking and acting. And as we see in all the topics uh, uh, that uh, Paul addresses and where the Corinthian Christians had problems in, uh, Paul makes a beeline to Jesus and very often a beeline to uh, the cross uh, and to the resurrection. Paul is convinced that uh, the everyday life of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians arises out of the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who mediates the holiness of God, who is uh, present in the church through his spirit. The goal of Christian ethics is the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So when, whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. That is the goal of Christian ethics. The model of Christian ethics is the behavior of Jesus Christ and the example of the apostles. Chapter 11, verse 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ, as I am of the Messiah. The power of Christian ethics is the Holy Spirit of God who mediates the saving and transformative work of Jesus Christ. Chapter 6, verse 11 and 19, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own. It is only in 1 Corinthians uh, that Paul quotes words of Jesus in his argument. He bases his command to married believers that the wife should not separate from her husband in a command of the Lord. Chapter 7, verse 10, alluding to what Mark reports Jesus saying, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. If she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Mark 10, 11 and 12. 
Paul quotes the words of Jesus during the Last Supper in the night in which he was betrayed. When Jesus said to the disciples, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul quotes words of Jesus. He doesn't do that all the time, uh, but he does it sometimes. And uh, for Paul, the words of Jesus has un has, uh, have unquestionable authority. If and when Jesus has spoken on a particular matter, his words uh, are the end uh, of the discussion. Uh, and so Jesus is foundational for Christian ethics. Second, uh, divisive behavior. The first four chapters in 1 Corinthians, Paul addresses divisions in the church. The unity of the church for Paul is not a mere idea. Uh, Roman Catholics are doing better on the unity of the church. We Protestants seem to not really care much about the unity of the church. For Paul, the unity of the church is not a mere idea and not an unreachable ideal but a tangible, experiential reality that results from the presence of God, the presence of Jesus Messiah, the presence of the Holy Spirit in the church and in the lives of the followers of Jesus. Most imperatives in 1 Corinthians are concerned with the unity of the church, not only in chapters 1 through 4, but uh, in uh, several of the later chapters as well. The divisions in the church in Corinth were triggered by the attachment of some of the educated Corinthian believers to, con to the contemporary secular competitiveness of teachers and orators, uh, which were accompanied by declarations of loyalty to their students and uh, of students to their masters. Some of the Christians promoted such a personal attachment to Paul the missionary teacher and theologian who had founded the congregation, and also, respectively, to Apollos, a subsequent teacher, or to Cephas, Simon Peter, who may have visited Corinth or whom they met in some other city of the Eastern Mediterranean. And in this response, Paul focuses fundamentally on teachers. He begins his discussion in chapter 1, verse 10, following by clarifying that he appeals to them by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, chapter 1, verse 10. He asks the rhetorical question whether the Messiah has been divided or whether he, Paul, was crucified for them, verse 14, arguing that there is only one Messiah in which both the Jewish and the Gentile believers have found their new identity as members of the Messianic people of God. There is only one death by crucifixion, which brought about God's forgiveness of sins and which achieved their salvation. Since there is only one Messiah, there is only one Messianic people of God. To divide the Messianic people of God into factions of competing loyalty pledges to missionaries, teachers, and preachers is to divide the Messiah, which is a grotesque suggestion. To pledge loyalty to different Christian leaders is to negate the significance of Jesus' death on the cross. Followers of Jesus owe their salvation to Jesus' death, and so they owe, uh, owe loyalty to Jesus exclusively, the only Messiah and Lord. In the second section uh, of his uh, treatment of the divisions in the church, Paul explains the gospel as the message about the cross on which Jesus died, a message that cannot be grasped on the basis of rhetorical brilliance or superior argumentation. Or, and therefore must be not aligned with the wisdom of the world. The gospel is focused on the crucified Messiah Jesus, and you cannot wax eloquently about a person hanging on a cross. Because there you see shame. People were crucified nude, probably Jesus as well. And you cannot make that a part of some logical, ethical uh, uh, some logical, brilliant discussion where you want to impress people. The gospel, focused as it is on the crucified Messiah, Jesus, is regarded, therefore, as foolishness by Jews and as nonsense by Greeks. Both cannot understand God's revelation in Jesus' Messiah. 
The gospel of the crucified Messiah Jesus can be understood only, Paul argues, as a result of the power of God, who leads Jews and Gentiles to a saving knowledge of Jesus, the crucified Messiah. Uh, uh, chapter uh, 1 verse 18 the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of God chapter 1 22 through 24 for Jews demand signs this Greeks desire wisdom but we proclaim Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Greeks but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And then in chapter 2, uh, verse 4 and 5, He is the source of your life in Jesus Christ, who became for us a wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. My speech, and so there Paul talks how he behaved as a pioneer missionary. He talks about what he did. My speech, my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, he did not come with brilliant rhetoric or superior argumentation, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. When people are converted, this is never the result of brilliant rhetoric, if they are real conversions, but by the action of uh, the power of God and of the Holy Spirit. Since it is the power of God who convinces people of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ crucified through the work of the Holy Spirit, boasting in the rhetorical capabilities of missionaries, priests, and teachers is not only vain, but an insult to God, since the presence of God annuls all human boasting. Understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ crucified should prompt a rejection of secular values of competitive superiority and the abandonment of speech which praises this or that teacher over against another teacher. This is as much a theological necessity as it is an ethical uh, choice. Secondly, litigation among believers. If you move through 1 Corinthians, you uh, cover a lot of very different topics. So there were church people who, uh, 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 who initiated uh, legal cases uh, against other uh, uh, believers. So these would have been uh, wealthy believers. Only the wealthy uh, members of the elite had access to the courts. Uh, poor people did not have access to the courts. So it was rich Christians who caused that problem. And Paul argues that followers of Jesus must not appeal to unbelievers to decide personal controversies which is absurd, chapter 6, verse 1 and 6. They should solve legal problems about minor matters internally, verse 5, which is both possible and natural, since uh, these are disputes among brothers, verse 5 and 6 and 8, brothers who will inherit the kingdom of God, verse 9 and 10, and who, because they are saints, will judge the world, verse 2 and 3. Paul reminds the believers that they no, no longer live according to the behavioral patterns of society in Roman Corinth, where fornication, idolatry, adultery, prostitution, sodomy, theft, greed, and drunkenness are everyday realities. He tells them, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. The formula in the name of refers to the power and authority of the person mentioned here the power and authority of Jesus, who is Lord and Messiah. God purified the members of the Corinthian congregation from the impurity of sinful behavior. He declared them holy and righteous on account of the authority of Jesus, who is the crucified and risen Messiah and Lord, who sits at the right hand of God, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and whose judgment over the world his followers will participate. The... Uh, uh, and uh, this is a reality, therefore, uh, that is a reality not just of words, but personal experience in everyday living. It is a reality that makes follower of Jesus willing to be wronged and defrauded rather than fight against fellow believers before unrighteous justice, uh, judges. Uh, chapter 6, verse 7. The fourth area we briefly want to look at uh, is the area of uh, sexual ethics. 
Paul discusses two matters of sexual ethics. One member lived in an incestuous relationship with his uh, stepmother, chapter 5, verse 1. The church tolerated this behavior. Paul says that they are even proud of it. They were surely not proud that someone uh, was doing this kind of behavior. Uh, it seems they were uh, proud that this, mem uh, that this person was a member of the church. Evidently, he was a member of the elite. And uh, uh, so they were proud that this person uh, uh, was uh, in uh, the church, chapter 5, verse 2. Point, Paul points out that this type of immoral behavior is not found even among pagans. Indeed, it was illegal to marry persons to whom one was related by marriage, including an aunt, a mother-in-law, a sister-in-law, or a stepmother. In Roman law, sexual relations between a stepmother and a stepson uh, was regarded as uh, incest, which was also prohibited according to Mosaic and Jewish law, Leviticus 18 verse eight, uh, uh, and uh, Leviticus 20. The punishment for incestuous relations was harsh. The two people involved uh, were sent to exile, uh, were sent into exile to live on an island, uh, presumably two different islands. Uh, and uh, at that time, the Greek islands were often bare. Uh, I mean, you might actually perish when you had no connections there. And they lost both their property and their honor. So incest was a very serious sin. But the Corinthian church tolerated that church member in uh, to be in the church. They didn't make a move. Paul calls on the congregation to deal with, mat with this matter immediately and decisively, removing the man from the congregation, evidently in the hope that he would then repent and be saved on the day of judgment. Uh, chapter 5, 3, 4, and 5. The one argument Paul provides by the behavior of the incestuous man is wrong is his brief reference to the criminal nature of such behavior. Five words in the Greek text in chapter 5, verse 1. He elaborates much more fully on the intolerable behavior of the congregation who had refused to take action against the man. Uh, this runs from verses 6 through 13. Paul argues with the purity of the church whose members constitute the messianic people of God in the new covenant. Paul uses three metaphors. The church is a house that needs to be kept pure as old yeast is removed from Jewish houses before the Passover festival. The church is a new batch of unleavened dough which uh, guarantees the saving presence of God. And the church is a place at which people celebrate uh, God's salvation. The central argument uh, uh, which links these three metaphors refers to Jesus' death on the cross. So Paul is back at uh, the cross. Uh, uh, chapter 5, verse 7. For our pastor lamb, Christ has been sacrificed. Paul presupposes that the Corinthian believers know the early Christian tradition of a typological understanding of Jesus' death as Passover lamb, God's liberation of the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt corresponds typologically to God's liberation of human beings from the slavery of sin. Jesus death saves sinners from the divine death sentence on the day of judgment. It liberates sinners from the bondage of sin. It constitutes a new face in the history of the people of God. And so since Jesus' death effected the liberation from sin, the Corinthian congregation cannot tolerate sinful behavior that persists. Since Jesus' death constitutes the messianic people of God, which shares in God's purity and holiness, the believers in Corinth must make sure that the church member who is evidently unwilling to repent and change his behavior is removed from the congregation whose purity and holiness uh, must be preserved. Another matter of sexual ethics that Paul discusses is the practice of some believers in Corinth to continue uh, their visits to prostitutes which was acceptable behavior in Greco-Roman society. Pseudo Demosthenes says in his speech against the Neaira, I quote, we have our courtesans for pleasure, concubines for looking after our daily physical needs, and wives for the procreation of legitimate children and to take good care of domestic matters. Uh, Blutarch advises women not to become angry when their husbands have sex with another woman, 
perhaps a slave. He suggests that they, that they should recognize that when their husbands have uh, extra marital, uh, marital sexual re relations, they express their respect for their spouses, whom they do not want to humiliate with their sexual fantasies, which they live out with other women. Uh, it is not a coincidence that the Latin language had 50 synonyms for the word prostitute. Some moral philosophers did criticize extramarital, uh, extramarital sexual activities, but their exhortations were ignored. Who reads philosophers? Uh, Paul decisively rejects premarital and extramarital sex, providing four reasons. First, Paul emphasizes that Christian freedom does not mean that I make my own laws so that I can say all things are lawful for me. It is limited by the question what benefits others, which is a fundamental criterion of Christian ethics, that I do what benefits others. The sentence, not all things are beneficial, chapter 6, verse 12, applies among other things to prostitution. It is not beneficial. The freedom of the gospel is the freedom to live in such a man manner that others benefit from what I do. Second, freedom is further limited by the avoidance of new dependencies. The freedom of a believer is not a freedom in seemingly splendid independence. A believer is committed to the conviction expressed in verse 12, I will not be dominated by anything except the Lord, by the Lord, obviously. Paul argues that as food and stomach have a mutual relationship that is clearly defined, the human body fulfills its particular role only when it acts in its relatedness to the Lord. Which means that as Jesus is Lord, he is, verse 13, the Lord for the body. The body is the realm where the Lord Jesus exercises his authority. Believers do not belong to themselves, but to the Lord. They do not freely decide what they can and cannot do, since they are subject to the authority of the Lord. Paul goes on to say that food and stomachs will perish, but the body will be raised from uh, the dead, as God raised Jesus from the dead by his power, verse 14. This means that believers will not allow their bodies to engage in unholy acts. They live holy lives in anticipation of living in the presence of God who is holy. Third argument, since the bodies of believers are members of the body of Jesus Christ, they cannot at the same time be members uh, of a prostitute becoming one body with her verses 15 through 17. Fourth, the unity with the Messiah Jesus who bought them with a price, that is, who paid with his life to save them from God's judgment of their sin, constitutes their identity as uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit, which means they can and must glorify God in their bodies. And that means they cannot visit uh, uh, prostitutes. Uh, we need to come to a close of so the fifth point. Uh, I will make uh, very brief. Uh, these are social ambitions. One example of social realities that are impacted by faith in Jesus Christ concerns Paul's discussion where the Christians can participate in banquets in pagan temples. There were some Corinthian Christians who said, we have a right to attend banquets in pagan temples. These again would be uh, uh, the more well-to-do Christians who might be invited uh, to the wedding, perhaps, of the uh, 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 president of the Guild of the Bakers. And perhaps his uh, first son uh, has uh, uh, his uh, wedding, and the, uh, uh, the banquet would be held in a dining hall uh, attached to a temple. In Corinth, there's a temple of Asclepius, uh, where three dining rooms have actually been excavated. Uh, so we, we have actual evidence from Corinth for this uh, uh, reality. And uh, again, Paul in his argumentation, uh, and I need to be uh, brief here, uh, 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 makes a beeline to the cross. Uh, he says in verse 11 and 12, so by your knowledge, their apparent knowledge that it's a pain to die in pagan temples, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against rights. Uh, you sin uh, against Christ. Against the claim they have a right to dine in uh, pagan uh, temples, Paul asserts that being an apostle, he has the right to financial support, but he doesn't make use of this right because he's rather willing to endure anything than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. 
And if uh, Christians died in pagan temples, this would not be magic food, but other people may think they condone or even acknowledge pagan gods who are worshipped in this temple, and therefore they cannot do it. And then the climax of this argument is that he reminds them what happens when they celebrate the Lord's Supper, chapter 10. The cup of blessing that we bless. Is it, it is, not, is it not the sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break. Is it not the sharing of the body of Christ? You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord uh, and uh, the table of the demons. Loyalty to Jesus Christ excludes the possibility to dine in pagan temples. I conclude in the great chapter uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about the body. That seems to be the climax of the letter. It matters what we do with our bodies. Why? Because our bodies will be raised from the dead. And uh, without having the time, obviously, to trace uh, the uh, argument, uh, uh, Paul talks about, uh, at the beginning of the chapter, about Christ's death, about his resurrection, about the certainty of the future bodily resurrection, and therefore how we behave in our bodies does matter. I conclude with a quotation from chapter 15, 33, 34, 57, 58. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Come to a sober and right mind. Sin no more. For some people have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. But thanks to uh, God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord. Because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. We have time for uh, one question. Yes, we have one right here. Hello, Dr. Schnabel. Excellent, excellent presentation. You present the Corinthian believers in their understanding of love, more loving than their culture, a willingness to set aside the biblical understandings of morality to accept this man into their midst. <clears throat> Wouldn't that be parallel with Christian churches that have set aside Christian mor biblical morality to accept divorce and remarriage, homosexuality, marriage of homosexuals, and our new transsexual issues? I think the process, uh, I think for many, is very much the same indeed, but not only let's say in the last 20 or 30 or 40 years in the US, but in many other cultures as well. Uh, so uh, it seems uh, most of the problems uh, in the Corinthian church are linked with the more well-to-do, uh, with uh, richer people. Uh, I didn't even talk about head covering. Uh, and so every single problem can be tied to uh, uh, values and modes of behavior in a Roman society. Uh, 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 Corinth was a Roman city in the first century. It had been destroyed in 186 BC, uh, and then they lay waste basically for 100 years, was re-established of a Roman colony by Caesar, uh, and then uh, a further build up under Augustus. And so they had Roman values uh, in terms of uh, ethical behavior, social values in terms of uh, rhetoric, and so on. And so uh, uh, they did not forget uh, uh, maybe biblical roots, but they realized how difficult it may actually be uh, to live according to uh, the standards uh, of biblical ethics, of Christian ethics, which largely is Old Testament ethics, biblical uh, ethics. Uh, and so they were, uh, they were new Christians. Uh, they had been Christians at the time Paul writes the letter for less than 10 years. And so they were still tied to old their traditional modes of behavior which were just normal in uh, their uh, society, in the society of the city. And of course, if you are different, you stick out and you might be ostracized uh, by, uh, the, uh, uh, by society in which you live and that may lead to suffering very quickly. Uh, not outright persecution with imprisonment, 
uh, or even death. That happened especially in the second and third uh, century, much more so. Uh, but uh, if uh, you are a Christian baker, you don't go to the wedding uh, banquet uh, of the president of the baker's guild. You see, he might tell others, don't sell him uh, any flour. And then you might be out of business very quickly, simply because you are a Christian. Uh, and uh, so there might be suffering involved. Paul talks about suffering, not so much in First Corinthians, but in Second Corinthians. Uh, and so yes, in every society, when behavior of Christians is not informed uh, by uh, scriptural authority, but by what everyone else does, uh, then uh, uh, we, uh, we have the same scenario as here. I mean, this is often what people say, isn't it? Even in minor matters, well, everyone is doing that. Let's say everyone is cheating on taxes. Uh, well, sometimes when I go fast uh, on the interstate uh, and I uh, point out to my wife, well, everyone is going fast, she says, yeah, that will be the non-valid excuse of everyone who is in hell. Uh, 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 they say, everyone does it, uh, everyone in society. And so that's a process that uh, I, I think can be found. I, probably no study has been done. There would be a wonderful church historical study how that uh, how behavior in society at large that uh, uh, diverges from, let's say, natural law and from biblical law, how that has infiltrated uh, the church. Uh, and so uh, the examples you mentioned are very good examples.